Okay, um, good afternoon. So uh, let's start our lecture. So um, on Tuesday, we talk about binomial distributions. So uh, we have this example, example three. Um, so someone claimed that he has the uh, extraordinary sens uh, sensory, extrasensory perception. That means he can see the outcome. Uh, of uh, like, in this case, it's toss a corn. So for ordinary people, we guessed what's the outcome and the chance of being correct is about half. But if he, this guy really got this um, extrasensory perception, then he should get it right every time. He can predict the outcome correctly every time. So we just try 10 times. And for ordinary people, when we got it five times correct or six times correct, can the ordinary people get 10 out of 10 times correct? Huh? Of course, yes. But the question is, how likely that these ordinary people will get 10 out of 10? So the chance is very small. You can work it out based on binomial distributions. All right? But then, uh, if this guy really got the, this ability to predict correctly every time, then uh, the chance of getting 10 out of 10 correct should be 1. All right? But now, um, he got... 7 out of 10. All right. Yeah, it's not that perfect. Sometimes he makes mistakes. So now the question is whether he can, I mean, he really have this uh, ability of predict correctly. All right. We wonder whether he has. All right. So, uh, how to do to answer or address this problem or this question? Whether he really has the ability of predicting correctly. So, what we do is not try to show that he has this ability, but show that for ordinary people, if he does not have that, then the chance that he got 7 out of 10, mm, not 7 out of 10, but instead getting better than 7 out of 10, uh, better or equal to 7 out of 10. Remember, on Tuesday, I mentioned about this. If I have 100 numbers, 1 to 100, the chance of picking one of them, so whether you got 50 or you got 95, are the same in this example. All right, 100 numbers, equally likely. Then, how, do I how, how can I uh, uh, conclude that 95 is a big, a big number, while 50 is not? Let me repeat it. How do you know that 95 out of this 100 number, 95 is a big number? Well, 50 is not. If you look at the chance of getting a 50 or getting a 95, the same, right? So we cannot just use the chance getting the number, all right, to justify that the number is big or not. So in fact, what we look at is, what's the chance that you get a number greater or equal to 95. So in that case, only six numbers are greater or equal to 95. So the probability is 6 over 100. While to get a number 50, you ask yourself, what's the chance that you get more extreme, bigger than 50? So the chance is 51 over 100. So come back to this one. So that's why we're not looking at the probability of getting such 7 out of 10 correct. We are asking, if he really that good can predict correctly or high chance of predict correctly, then the chance should be um, should, should get a result out of 10, get 7, 8, 9, 10. All, right, all these are showing that um, it uh, has a, a um, or, or the chance of uh, getting a number greater or equal to 7 times correct. All right, if that probability is very small, then that means 
it's really, really very unlikely that he will get seven or more correct if he's just an ordinary people. Right. So, so we ask this question. Seven out of ten correct if he is just a normal person. So what is this chance? If the chance is not that small, that means you can do it. He just did as good as other normal people did. Does. Then in that case, he does not have that. Okay? So, to translate it, we look at, we compare with a persons with no this uh, extrasensory perception. So the chance of correct is 0.5. And then check what's the chance that we got uh, more than seven times, more or equal to seven times. So, so here is how we do uh, solve this kind of problem. First of all, we have to define the random variable. What does the random variable mean? So here, x, everyone can write x, right? But in this problem, x means the number of correctly identified um, or guessed, correctly guessed the outcome out of 10 trials, 10 Bernoulli trials. In this trials, it's a toss. Or each trial is tossed the corn, all right? So, um, so this is our random variable x. And then the next question is, the, what is the distribution of x? So in this case, we know that x follow a binomial distribution of x. How x behaves can be modeled by a binomial distribution, uh, all right? Why? Because binomial distribution is to describe the number of successes out of n trials. So that very complicated formula, n choose x, right? Remember this formula? Right. This is the probability of the random variable equal to certain value, so long as x equal to 0, 1, up to n. All right. So if x has this characteristic, which measures the number of successes out of n independent dichotomous trials, then how it behaves is all described by this formula. All right. So x follow a binomial distribution. Then the next question is you have to figure out what is n and what is p. n is the number of trials. In this case, it's 10 toasters. So it's n equal to 10. And p equal to 0 0.5. Because here we assume that it's just an ordinary people. All right. And find out ordinary people, um, the chance of getting 10, uh, 7 out of 10 correct. So, so we address this question. So assume there's no ESP, get this probability. So we work out, it's turned out to be 0 0.17. 0 0.17. All right. Um, so this is from the, from the formula of ca calculating probability. But uh, uh, we can also get it from a statistical table for binomial distribution or used a graphic calculator or use um, software. I think Excel can do the job. Excel can do the job. So later I may show you how to do using Excel to get this answer. In fact, for Excel, I just need to compute 1 minus probability of x less or equal to 6, right? Because this is the complement event of this one. So is it equal to 1 minus uh, DIST and then 6 and and P and true. Okay, so the function is binomial binom dot dist referring to binomial distribution and there are four arguments there. The first one is your x. The second one is the n, the number of, number of trials. The third one is the probability of a success. All right. And the last one, true or false, 
means whether you want cumulative probability or not. So this last argument, so this is, this is x, this is n, this is p, and this is to tell whether we want cumulative probability or not. So in this case, I want the cumulative probability up to 6. So it's true. Then how about false? What will it give us if I put false in the fourth argument? Then it will give you the probability of x equal to 6. I don't want a cumulative. I just want the probability of x equal to 6. All right? So uh, you can try many ways to get this answer. All right, so now we got the answer, probability of x Greater or equal to 7 is 0.172. Two. So what do you think? Does this gentleman has ESP? So think of it like this way. We are, we are saying that, okay, this gentleman is just ordinary, an uh, ordinary person. He does not have the ESP. All right. Or any ordinary person. The chance of getting 7 7 out of 10 correct. And what's the chance? The chance is 0.18 or more. Uh, sorry, 0 0.17. 0 0.17. So do you think this is a very small chance? 0.17. Huh? Is 0.17 small? Why 0.17 is not small? Okay, unfortunately, uh, okay, uh, we, we, we have a usual way uh, that is about 5% or 1%. So there are the usual, uh, m the, the yardstick that we use, all right? 5% or 1%. You have, must have heard this before. This mentioned many quite frequently when we talk about testing hypothesis, the significance level. So why 5%, why 1%? So, uh, yeah, it, we, we just have been using that for many, many decades. So we just treat it, and everyone uh, use that, all right? Either 5% or 1%. Of course, you can use 10% as well. Even if you use 10% as the yardstick, this one is still considered as big, all right? So in that case, um, what does it mean? It means that ordinary people can do that. How can you say that you, are, you, are, you have uh, something different? You are not different from ordinary people who has no ESP. Okay, so that's the idea. So the whole problem, okay, you have to set up your random variable, find a distribution, the corresponding probability, set up your statement in terms of probability. We want to find the probability x greater or equal to 7. So now we got the probability, which is 0.1719. Then what's next? Okay, when we compute this probability, we base the assumption that this is a probability of uh, ordinary people to get the uh, 7 out of 10 correct. All right, so this is how we do it. Uh, I think I skipped the uh, uh, example 4. You can read it yourself. All right. Okay. Example 5. Let's look at example 5. So in example 5, so we have this manufacturer claims that, uh, this is his claim, uh, his claim is that at most 10% of his power supply units need services during a warranty period. Uh, I'm sorry, that I just used 10% to make it no easier to compute. We can appreciate the number. So in practice, if you have 10% that you need the uh, to repair, you need other surface that is very bad, all right? So uh, I just use it as a, a number to illustrate the idea. Okay, so he claims that at most 10%. That needs some uh, surfaces during the warranty period. All right, so now this, this uh, maybe independent lab want to find out whether his claim, this manufacturer's claim is justified. So we look at it, we get 20 units, all right? And then test it. And so suppose P is the probability that the unit need repair. All right. So in other words, in other words, what the what the manufacturer claim is that P is less or equal to ten. Oh, sorry, ten percent. 
10% per month. This is the claim of the manufacturer. So now I define P is the probability that a particular unit needs to repair. So in this case, a success means that it needs repair. The unit needs repair. All right. So now the technician make a rule saying that, okay, it will support the claim when P is less or equal to 5. Uh, sorry. Uh, support the claim P less or, equal, uh, less or equal to minus 1. All right. So he tried to get the data, okay? But he, he has not, uh, I mean, up to this point, I have not mentioned the decision rule that he will support, but then he, this claim is P less or equal to 0.1. All right, so he just look at these 20 units, try to test it and find out under this uh, warranty conditions, uh, how many of them out of these 20 have to I mean, need repair, all right? So here, I let x be the number of units that succeed. Uh, succeed. succeed means that it needs repair out of 20 of them. All right. So therefore, x is a binomial distribution with uh, binomial distribution with n equal to 20, and p is the probability of success. And what is p? Okay. So far, we have not described what is P, but P is just represent the probability that a unit needs repair. And the manufacturer claims that P is less or equal to 0.1. All right, now here is the decision rule. The technician suggests that, okay, I don't believe that P is less or equal to 10 if I, if I see or after I test it, I found out that the number of units that need repair is more, uh, greater or equal to five. Is it reasonable decisions in terms of x greater or equal to a certain number? Okay, there are two parts. First of all, is x big, bigger than a certain number, all right? Certain number. And this number is five. Or I should test, I don't believe what the manufacturers claim if x is less or equal to b, and that determine b. Okay, so which, which one should I use? I'm talking about I reject the claim. So if I reject the claim, that means I believe that p is greater than 0.1. If the probability of thing repair is big, of course, out of 20, you expect you see more more of the items need repair. So in other words, I should, I should, my decision rule to reject should be based on x greater or equal to certain number. All right. So if I decide that I will reject the claim if x is greater or equal to zero, then what does it mean? means nothing. That means no matter what happened, uh, I will say that your, your, I will reject your claim. Isn't it? If my claim, my A there, instead of 5, I put it 0. So that means no matter what outcome, so long as a number greater or equal to 0, I will reject the claim. So I will reject anyway. All right? So it does not make sense. All right. So now I choose 5. I choose five. So is it reasonable? Okay, so, um, and I will consider the claim is possible if x is less or equal to four. So it's a complement of each other. So if it's less or equal to four, I will not, I, I will not reject the now hypo I, I will not reject the claim that p is less or equal to point one. But if it is more than or equal to five, of the units needs repair, we will reject the claim. Okay, so, um, so let's start with assuming P is 0.1. Uh, this is the, the largest P that uh, the manufacturer will, I mean, um, 
we accept. I mean, the manifest saying that the P cannot be exceeding point one. So let's look at point one. P go to point one. So I work out the chance that x greater or equal to five when P is point one. All right. So use your calculator, use your software. All right, you can work this out. Then the the answer is point zero four. That means 4% chance that if P is equal to 0.1, all right, the chance that you see the number of defect, number of uh, items that you need to repair, all right, is more or equal to five, is very small chance, all right. So, so it seems that if the Manufacturer's aim is right, then the I I make a mistake and I I tell that I don't believe in this claim. The chance that I believe that or I I, I make a mistake is about four percent chance. Let me repeat it again. So if P is really less or equal to ten, uh, less or equal to ten percent, all right, then. And I do the experiment, I find out that the number of items that need repair, maybe five, maybe six, maybe seven, no matter what it is, so long as it's bigger or equal to five, I will reject the manufacturer's claim. All right? I make the decision. The decision may be wrong. And in this case, it's wrong because we assume that P is less or equal to 0.1, or in this case, P equal to 0.1, then the chance that I will reject it, reject the claim, is a four percent chance. So I have four percent chance making a mistake. Okay. Then not rejecting if P equal to point two. So I have to also worry about whether my decision is good or not. In case P is really bigger than point one. In this case, let's take a one value, a particular value, point two. P equal to point two, which is uh which is against the claim, all right? So what happens if P equal to point two? So I try to work out the chance I'm not rejecting the claim. That means I ask myself, all right, what is the chance that if P, this is, the claim is false, all right? So P is bigger than point one, because I assume it's point two. And then this one, I, I will not, reject, do not reject P less than, less or equal to point one. I do not reject this statement, P less or equal to point one. So what does it mean? It means that it's true that P is a number bigger than point one, but then in my experiment or in my test, I find out that the number of units that require repair is less or equal to four. So in that case, I will, I will believe in the claim. Although the actual probability of repair is 0.2, which is greater than the manufacturer's claim. So I want to figure out the probability. And the probability turned out to be 0 0.63, 63%. Is it good or not? Is it good or not? So it's like this. So P less or equal to 0.1, greater or equal to 0.1, all right? Two scenario. So this is the manufacturer's claim. So I have to choose between these two claims, all right? So now if X, my decision rule, this is my decision rule, huh? if the number of uh, units need repair is greater or equal to five, all right? Then I reject it. So I, I okay. So I will reject. So so that I only two decisions. Reject. Let, let me put it this way. Reject H naught. All right. And do not reject H naught. Do not reject H naught. Reject the claim All right. We haven't come to. Reject the claim, and do not reject the claim. All right. So. I do not I, I reject it so I make a mistake. Right? 
Is that, this is the answer. This is the true answer. And you say that, oh, this answer is wrong because I, be, I don't believe that. But, all right, if this P is really bigger than, P is really bigger than pawn one, then you make a correct decision. Your, your decision is correct because it's, P is big and then you say that, oh, it's big. I don't believe that it's less than pawn. So you make a right decision. All right. So in this case, we are referring to the chance of making a mistake. P is, P is pawn one, and then we reject the chance of committing this error. It's about 4%. All right? Now, how about the other way? So now, now, um, so I need to write it again. Okay, this is another scenario. All right, this time, this time, this is the na this is the nature. All right, this is the nature, or the answer. Uh, everyone wants to know the answer. So I told you, yeah, this is the answer. P is bigger than point one. It is twenty percent. Then I asked, when you reject the claim. So if this is the answer, you reject the claim. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. You do not reject the claim. Do not reject the claim. All right, and uh, so, and also reject the claim. So, okay. So now, now, uh, if this is true, you do not reject the claim. So it's correct. But this is the nature. So, okay, this is the answer. Answer. This is the answer. Sorry, this is the answer. All right. So you reject the claim. That is correct. You do not reject it, it's wrong. All right? Okay, so now, this one, if you, this happens, what's your decision? You reject the claim. You reject the claim. So you make the right decision. All right? P is bigger than pawn one, and you reject it. Okay, I, I'm sorry I confused you because I, I overlooked this one minus. So we are looking at this. This is the original event, all right? So look at this one. So in other words, I'm here, right? I, because once this occurs, I make my decision to not reject the claim. I think the number of units need re service is uh, very small, so I do not reject the claim. So I make a mistake. And what is the chance of making this mistake? It is 63%. All right. So what I'm trying to say is that I have only one decision rule. X greater or equal to five, I reject the claim. X less or equal to four, I do not reject the claim. All right. So because of this decision, under different scenario, all right, under different answer. If the answer is P is less than point one, less than equal to point one, then X bigger than five, you make the right decision. You reject the null hypothesis. But on the other hand, if P is really bigger than pawn one, I, I just use a particular value, pawn two, to illustrate the idea. So pawn two, okay? That means the, the manifest scheme is false. And I what was the chance that I do not reject, I make a decision not, not reject his claim. And the chance is quite high, all right? So it's 70, 73%. I want you to to understand this idea. We will repeat this again when we come to hypothesis testing. All right. So this is the idea that, okay, someone has a claim. So I, make, I try to see, make a decision whether I, I do not reject his claim or I re reject his claim. So I make a decision based on what I see from my, my random variable x. All right. x big. What is X? Uh? X is the number of items need repair. If this number is big, that means the P is, should be big. All right? So that's the logic behind my decision. So X greater than certain value, uh, certain number. In this case, I choose five. It's reasonable or not. So we compute this probability. In fact, the first one is the probability of committing a type one uh, uh, error. The second one is also a probability of committing an error. Another error. So we try to 
balance between these probabilities of making a Taiwan error. Think of it. I mentioned earlier, if my decision rule is whenever x greater or equal to zero, I will reject the claim. Right? Then, then I will not commit any type of the second, I mean, the, the, the error that when p is bigger than 0.1. It doesn't matter so long as it's any p, I will reject it. So, so long as p is bigger than 0.1, I make no mistakes because I reject it. But the problem is, the problem is, if the null hypothesis, if the claim is correct, p is less than 0.5, and I reject it, so I commit error. And this chance of error is 1. So you always commit the error when p is less than 0.1. Okay, we'll repeat this again when we come to hypothesis testing. All right, so, um, so this is what the, what the conclusion is. All right. Okay. So now we move on to look at another special type of a uh, special distribution. It's called negative binomial. Um, okay. It's something to do with binomial, but in the binomial distribution, now we have three three things. All right, this is the probability of a success. This is the number of success. And this is the number of trials. Which one are fixed? The number of trials is fixed. The, num the probability of success is fixed. What we have, I mean the random variable that we are looking at is x, which is the number of successes. Number of successes. All right. So now, what happens if I'm looking at a sequence of Bernoulli uh, experiment? All right. I want to have to ask what, how many experiments I have to do in order to get three successes. Three successes. All right. Uh, it's different from the binomial distribution. Binomial distribution, we fix the number of sequences, a number of uh, trials, and then look at how many success are there. Now, we fix the number of successes and ask how many trials do I need in order to get that successes. Obviously, if I need three successes, I need at least three trials. It can be four trials, can be five trials. Can it be 100 trials? Yes. Can it be a million trials? Yes. Is it possible? I just want three successes. Do I need to do the one million times in order to get three successes? Is this zero? No. <laughs> you may have, still have a lot of failures, all right? And then you finally get the third successes. So the the negative binomial is to look at the number of trials, which is the random variable. Okay, so now in this case, in reverse. So this number of, number of trials is our random variable. And this number of success, I call it k, is the, the fixed constant. All right, so uh, this is negative binomial. So, for example, I want the fifth successes in the seventh trial. What is the probability that I need to have the fifth successes in the seventh trial? So, obviously, all right, the first trial up to the seventh trial. So, the last one, can it, I mean, the seventh one, can it be a failure? Can this be a failure? I want to have five, the fifth successes occurring in the seventh trial. That means I want altogether five trials, but I need to have seven trials to get the five successes. All right? So this cannot be failure. It has to be successes. It has to be a success. 
right? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So if the last one is a failure, that means in the first six trial, there must be five successes, five successes here. All right. Then in that case, you get your five successes without going to the seven, go to the seventh trial. Then you already have five successes. So it defeat the one. So the last one must be a success. The last one must be a success. All right. Seventh trial. So the seventh must be a success. So in other words, now left behind is, all right. Um, okay, I need, I need five success. So, so p to power five. And one minus p to power two, right? So there's seven, seven trials, five successes and two failure. But how many sequence are there? How many sequence will give me five successes? So it is choose four out of six. In fact, I should write it like this: I choose among the first six. I need to choose four successes and two failures. All right. After that, I have to multiply the last one. The last, the seventh, must be a success. So multiply by p. So that is the probability of getting five successes, and need, um, the number of trials is seven. All right. So this is how we get the probability. Right, so C was uh, four as uh, uh, six C four choose four out of six. All right, so in this case, this is the problem. You need seven trials in order to get five, five or the fifth success in the seven trial. That means five successes altogether. So this is the probability. So can X equal to eight, nine, ten? Or 100? Yes. So, so the formula will be like this. Probability of x equal to x is equal to, I have k, I need k success. So k, uh, x minus 1, choose k minus 1. I need x trials to get k successes. So the k, the m, sorry, the x minus 1 trials, I need k minus 1 success. Then the last one, the x trial, x trial must be a success, right? So x minus one, one minus p, k minus one. All right, and then the all right, um, something wrong here. Uh, x minus 1, choose k minus 1, All right? Uh, then yeah, times p, correct. All right, so this is the probability, and x must be greater or equal to k. Oh, sorry, x equal to k. You must need k, k trials to get k success, can be k plus 1 k plus 2, and so on, up to infinity. All right, so we call this n b negative binomial, and with two parameters, the probability of a success, and this is the number of successes. All right, and the p probability function is given by this. Sorry, uh, I make a mistake here. This one is not k minus one. It is uh, k minus one. All right, uh, trials. All right, and minus k minus one. So this one should be x minus k. X minus k. All right, I'm sorry. All right. You need x minus k uh, failure. 
All the failures must occur in this X minus 1 trial. The last one, the X trial, must be a success. Alright, so uh, this is the PDF, and it's equal to this expression. Whenever X is equal to K, or K plus 1, or K plus 2, uh, um, I'm too lazy. You should also just make it complete. It's equal to 0 otherwise. All right, it's zero otherwise. That means if x is not one of this number, for example, x equal to two, while k is five, then the probability should be zero. All right, um, so now we have the random variable, and we understand this random variable represent the number of trials to get k successes in k uh, in um, than a sequence of a binomial uh, experiment. Then next we calculate the expectation and the variance. So the expectation of the random variable is k over p, and the variance is 1 minus p times k over p squared. All right, uh, I don't want to derive it. Uh, all right, so if you're interested, you can derive it yourself. But... Um, I just want you to have some idea what it means. For example, expectation of x equal to k over p. You can think of it, all right? If I want k successes, how many trials do I need? Now, if p is small, if p is small, then your expectation of x will be large. You see? Okay. Obviously, if the number of success, sorry, if the probability of success is small, of course, you want k success, you need to have more trials in order to achieve k successes. Now, if p is large, for example, let's say p equal to 0.9, for example, and I want two successes, then I expect it's about 2.2 times or trials, then I will get two successes. So that means majority of the time, I just need two or three, all right? Maybe four, but I don't need like 10 trials in order to get two successes with the P, if P is equal to 0.9. So we can look at from this expectation. So I want you to understand that this expectation of X have a meaning have the meaning. So in this case, it simply means that if p is small, p is a denominator, if p is small, then k over p is big. What does it mean? That means you expect number of trials will be big if p is small. Right? Now similarly, if you look at the variance of x, if p is small, then you can see that the numerator, if p is small, the numerator is look like a k. 1 minus p will be big, and then 1 minus p, time, or 1 minus p will be close to 1. And it's, the numerator is still like k. But then the denominator is p squared. So it's even, after you divide by p squared, it's even big. The variance is very huge. But on the other hand, if p is large, all right, then the variance will be small, because now the denominator, I will not say it's close to 1, but then, is still a big number, while the numerator is very small. Let's say p equal to 0 0.1. Then the numerator becomes 0 0.1 times k. All right? It's a small number. While the denominator is 0.9 squared. So it's 0.81. All right? So I'm trying to say is that, okay, for example, p equal to 0.99. All right? Make it too, so extreme. Then this one is almost like 1 minus 0.99, all right? So this one is 0 0.01 times k. So it's hundreds of k. On the other hand, uh, what is 0.99? Uh, what is 0.99 square? It's close to 1, all right? Uh -huh. I only know, it's like I can only work for 1. So 0 0.9, so this is 0 0.1k, and this is 0.81. So you can see that this is still a big 
uh, uh, okay. um, is, is, is big, uh, is a small number, it's point, only one tenth of k, and then divide by a number which is close to one. On the other hand, if p equal to point one, or point zero one, All right, this reference becomes 0.99 times k divided by 0.01 squared. So the numerator is almost like k, but while the denominator becomes 0.01 squared, which becomes 0.0001 with three zeros there. So the value will be very big. So what does it mean? It means that if p is small, all right, then the variation because the chance of success is very small. So you may need a lot of trials, many trials, or maybe a few trials. So the variation is quite big. So I want you to, although we did not show how to derive it, but you at least you have some idea how to interpret the expectation and the variance. How it changes, how it behaves for different values of P or K. So of course, uh, if you need a bigger number of successes, of course you need more number of trials, a bigger number of trials. All right, so let's uh, look at example. So in this example, we're talking about NBA championship. So NBA is now suddenly uh, in the news of this part of the world. All right. Um, so, so suppose we have two teams, A and B, all right, face each other in the championship games. And A is supposed to be a better team. It has a higher chance of beating team B. And the probability is 0.55. Uh, in all these uh, American uh, uh, sports, I think uh, in uh, baseball, in hockey, in basketball, in in, in their football, the final is to pay seven games. Whoever wins four games, the first one who wins four games, will get the, get the champion. All right? So you, have, you can lose all the first three, so long as you don't lo lose the fourth one, but and then in subsequent, you, you win four games, then you still be the champion. All right? So we ask, what's the chance that Team A will win the series? Uh, in the sixth game. So this fits naturally with our, our um, negative binomial. Why? Because the number of success is fixed. It's four. You need to win four games. All right? And the probability in this case, we're, we're talking about team A. We're looking at team A. So the probability of success is 0.55. So this translated, oh, okay. so x, x represent the number of games, that means number of trials, all right? Number of games that need to play in order to get four wins for A, for team A, all right? For team A to get four wins. So this X follow a negative binomial with number of success being four and the probability of success is 0.55, uh, 0.55. all right? So this translate. A is to ask us to compute probability x equal to 6. Okay, what is the probability that team A will win the series? Do we have already done it? Win the series, right? So, we have to compute the chance of winning a series. Am I right? No, this is to win the series when we play, we need to play six games. I can just play four games and win the series, right? Or win the, all the first four games, finish. Team B out. I may need to play five games or six games or seven games. Do I need to play seven games? Yes or no? Right. So the first six games, I win three, I mean team A, uh, won three games, and then Team B also won uh, three games. So the seventh will be determined. 
so is okay so this is what we suppose okay so this is what I just mentioned and then the first one is x equal to 6 so this is the probability and the second qu question B is this one all right now for this one it's supposed to be 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 all right but we don't have you don't have this no no such thing all right because you need just seven games to get four you will not go to game eight right because after seven games one of the teams will win four right so we will not go beyond that so we just need to compute this uh, this four probabilities and add them up and the answer is 0.6 So, so it seems that team A has an advantage of winning. So what is the chance that B, team B, wins the, the series? One minus, right? Why, why one minus? Huh? One minus. So if you just one minus, then you just guess. But if you're able to know why is it one minus, can Team C win the series? There are only two teams playing this championship. If A does not win, it won't team. It won't be Team C. It must be Team B. So it's complement event of each other. So that's why it's one minus. All right. So, here's another question. Now, for one game only, uh, the chance of A winning is 0 0.55, while for B winning is 0.45, of course, right? But now, for four, to, to win four out of seven games, team A has a higher chance. It got 60%. All right. So, naturally, I will ask, uh, maybe I, not fair, right? Uh, team B, okay. Don't play seven games and need four. I want to have play ten games. Oh no, not ten. Eleven. Um, um, make it twenty-one. All right. Whoever win ten games out of twenty-one will get the championship. Will it be better? Okay. If I'm the manager of Team B, I say, okay, yeah, okay, this is pawn six there. Mm, even worse. So I propose. All right. We we change the rule. Play ten. Uh, 21 games, whoever wins 10 games will get the champion. So, will I have a higher chance to get as a team B? So you figure out yourself, all right? And then, next time if you read the managers of these teams, uh, you have to know what's the rules that favor to you. If you are the strong team, what do you play? What strategy do you play? Or if you're the weaker team, what to play, how to play the game? So ask yourself, so how about winning 10 games out of 21, right? It must be eh, 11, uh, sorry, eh? 11, 11, not, not 10, 11 games out of 21, out of 21. Must be slightly more than half, all right? Okay, another example. We have busy time for telephone exchange. All right. Suppose 5% chance that it is busy for any connection. All right. We are interested to know that I need to try five attempts to get it connected. All right. Now, here, each time I call, there are two outcomes. Either I got it through, that means connected, or I, it does not get through, so it's not connected. So it's a, a Bernoulli experiment. And now the question is, I want to get through. I want to know how many try, how many calls do I get to call in order to get through. All right. So, yeah. So, what is the chance I need five? 
five attempts. Five attempts. So, so x, the random variable, x is the number of trials. That's the number of calls that you call. All right? Then how about the number of successes? How many success we want? Only one. I want to know to get through. I mean, call once, fail. Okay? Call the second time, fail. Third time, fail. Fourth time, get through. So I, not, I need four attempts to get through. All right? In this example, there are only one, a number of successes we are interested in is only one. I want to know, I want to get through. All right? So, x follow a negative binomial, number of uh, attempts, and the probability of success is 0.05, all right? But since k is equal to 1, we just need one success. And we have a special name for it. We call that geometric, geometric distribution. With k equal to 1 and p. Remember the formula? The f of x for negative binomial is what? Huh? x minus 1, right? And then choose k minus 1. Then this is p to power uh, k, and then 1 minus p, x minus k, right? Correct or not? Now, if k equal to 1, then this will be k x minus 1, we pick up 0. And this will be p to power 1, k equal to 1, right? And then this one is what? 1 minus p to power x minus 1. What is this number? I choose nothing out of k minus 1. How many ways that you can choose nothing out of k minus 1? Huh? One way, uh, not zero ways. Uh. One way, uh, you choose nothing. So that's the way that you do. Choose nothing is also a way to choose. Uh. Choose nothing. No one will be chosen. All right, one way. If you don't believe it, then you substitute, follow from the definition of this. It's x minus 1 factorial over 0 factorial, divide, I mean, and uh, mod, uh, divide by x minus 1 factorial. So it cancel is equal to 1. If you don't, you don't understand the logic, then you do this one now. So they cancel out. A cancel is not zero, ah. Huh? It's one. This one is one, so it's one. All right? So a negative binomial with k equal to one, we call it geometric with p. Because it's understood that we're looking at only one success, the first success. All right, the number of trials that you have get the first success. So in other words, you need the first x minus 1 failure, and then the last one is a success. All right, so this is the, the way that we do it. So this, for x equal to 5, so we work out the chance is 0 0.04. So uh, with p equal to 0 0.05, you need 5 trials to get the first success. It's about... 4%. So because the chance of going through, uh, going through uh, is only 5% chance, uh, you may need a lot of attempt. Right? You know what is the expectation of, what is the expectation of X? That means, what do you expect the number of calls that you need in order to get through? Sometimes, it may be less, sometimes maybe more. Getting five, the chance getting through in the fifth attempt is only about four percent. All right. So, what is expectation of x? Oh, uh, this is the the Excel command for uh, negative binomial. Uh, by the way, uh, I don't know if you have tried it before or not. But uh, I have some problem. It seems that different version of uh, Microsoft Excel, uh, some accept semicolon to divide into arguments. 
some just accept comma. So if your, you use, follow this one, it does not work, then you change the semicolons to comma and try it out. So there are uh, one, two, three. There are three, there are three, uh, sorry, four, four, four arguments. So it's the same thing. So the first one is the number of failure. It's not the extra, it's the number of failures. And the, num the second one is the number of success. Then, what is X? Uh? X is the number of trials. So what is the number of trials? Uh? Uh, how do I get? I, w I want to know what is the probability of the number of trials equal to a certain number. How can I apply it? Okay, we are told that you need the first argument is the number of failure. The second argument is the number of successes. The third one is the probability of success. And the fourth one is whether it's cumulative or not. So go back to our geometric theories. Just now, ah, I want to compute this one. So x follow a negative binomial with k equal 1 and probability of success is 0.05. So what is this number? I want x equal to 5, probability. So what is the number of failures? Huh? 4, right? I have 5 trials, and I want 1 success. So this is 4. This is 1. These two numbers should add up equal to your x. To add up equal to x, x is the number of trials. Trials is either failure or success. So the two add up equal to your x. These two numbers add up this plus this number plus this number will give you the number of trials. So this is the number of trials that we are asking. So this one is 0 0.05. And is it cumulative? No. So we put it false. And then you should get this number. All right. Try it out, huh? If you don't get it, let me know. All right. Okay. So this is the answer. Oh. Uh, gee. So, you see, I did not mention. Uh, oh, yeah. In fact, I did it right. Expectation of x equal to k over p, right? And ex variance of x is equal to k over uh, 1 minus p over p squared, right? So based on this one, now I ask. So in this example two, uh, how many attempts or how many trials do I need in order to get through? So P is 0 0.05 and K, what is K? Uh? 1. So it's 1 over 0 0.05. So we expect 20 attempts in order to get through. So sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more, but as an average or what we expect is 20. It's K, which is 1, and P is 0 0.05. So it's 1 over 0 0.05, which is 20. So we expect you call 20 times in order to get through. All right? Expect, huh? so you can have less, you can have more. More times and so on. OK. Another family of distribution called Poisson distribution. This is very useful. And it's different from the previous two. We're still talking about the number of successes. Oh, uh, of course, binomial, we talk about number of successes. Negative binomial, we talk about the number of trials. Poisson, again, we talk about the number of successes. But it's not the number of successes over uh, how, over number of trials, but over a specified interval or region, all right? So, okay, maybe 
this is my interval, for example, the time. Over this period of time, how many occurrence, how many success, how many occurrence are there over this period of time? It can extend it to not just linear an interval, but to a region. So how many occurrence over a specified region? All right. So that can be modeled by a Poisson distribution. Let me repeat it. In a Poisson, if you say a random variable follow a Poisson distribution, this random variable can be interpreted as the number of successes or number of occurrence, number of occurrence in a fixed interval or a fixed region or a fixed volume. All right? So, um, so it can be an interval, all right? So uh, Poisson experiments can be uh, like the following, all right? It's the number of telephone calls in an hour, all right? Or the number of games postponed during the season. So in this case, in the first example, it is the period or the interval is an hour. So we are talking about the number of occurrence, and the occurrence is a call. So we are looking at how many calls within this interval one hour. The second example, all right, is a certain um, number of months, okay, for a football set, uh, session, a football season. Football season usually is about uh, not exactly a one year, maybe maybe about I don't know, maybe about ten months or eight months. All right. So over this period of time, so we want to know how many games, not games played, but how many games that need to be uh, postponed. That means it does not play. It is not played uh, at the designated time. So that is uh, considered as a uh, occurrence. Or success. Success means that the game is postponed. All right. We want to find the number of successes. That means the number of games that postponed. All right. So we can also have this this case. So x represents the number of mushrooms in a plot of land. So in this case, it's not an interval, but a plot of land, an area, and we want to know the number of mushrooms. So the occurrence of mushroom is considered as a success. Or a number of bacteria in a given culture. So in a given culture, in the lab, usually it's in disk or in, in something. And then we, we check the number of culture. That means the number of, um, sorry, number of bacteria occurred. Uh, so we find the number of bacteria in a given culture. So that also follow a Poisson distribution. Or the number of mistakes over a page. Okay, over a page, uh, the number of errors. So an uh, error occurred means a success. So we have this Poisson experiment, all right? So have the following properties. Uh, to make it easy, we talk about a time interval. We talk about just a, a time interval. All right. So, for example, I want to know the number of calls within this period from zero to t. All right. So, in saying that, the number of successes means number of calls. All right. Over this time interval are independent for those uh, occurring in the um, disjoint time interval. So you can think of it like this: If I divide this into many sub-intervals, all right. Then the number of occurrence in this interval is independent of other intervals. Nothing to do with other intervals. Whether this one has no occurrence, or one occurrence, or two occurrence, or the number of success is one, zero, one, two, three, has nothing with other intervals. The number of occurrence in the other interval. So that's what we mean by independence. So long as these intervals have no overlapping, and what happened to this interval? has nothing to do with other interval. So that's the first criteria. Second one, the probability of single success for a very short time interval is proportional to the length of the time interval. 
All right. So what does it mean? It means that the chance of getting one occurrence over this interval is proportional to the length. All right. And nothing to do with other intervals. Okay? Now, the next one. The probability of more than one success in such a short time interval. That's why we have to stress that it's a short time interval. All right? So you may think that if I divide it into two intervals, all right, then the number of occurrence over here may be many. But now if I divide into a small sub-interval, so the number of occurrence here, okay, is likely to be 0 or 1. And we assume that the chance of getting more than one, more than one success is negligible. That means we can trace zero. So the whole idea is that I try to get a very small, a very small intervals. And then the chance of getting zero success or one success. But the chance of getting more than, uh, more or equal to two success are negligible. That means zero. So in that case, you can treat this sub-interval as one Bernoulli trial. Either you got zero success or one success. The chance of getting more than one success is close to zero, so we can forget about it. Can I do that? Yes, of course. I just try to get the interval smaller and smaller so that there are only zero or one occurrence in that sub-interval. Then, then the number of success is considered as a Poisson random variable. All right. So, function is given by this formula. All right. And x can be 0, 1, 2, 3, up to infinity. All right. Uh, this, okay. There are e, there are lambda, there are x in this expression. X is the number of successes or occurrence. What is this E? Uh? If you look at your calculator, there's an E there. All right? E is a special number. And E to power X is a very special function. You know this function? You know the value? Seriously. Uh, we don't know the value. It's a, a, approximately 2.7 something something, right? This is a very interesting function. Uh, you differentiate it with respect to x. You will get back e to the power x. All right? And e to the power x is equal to 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial and so on. So it's a series. And you differentiate equal to itself. All right? Uh, only e to the power x, ah. Uh, not e to the power 2x, uh, differentiate e to the power 2x does not equal to e to the power 2x. Okay, and lambda, lambda is the parameter. Later on, uh, in fact I mentioned expectation of x uh, is equal to lambda. This lambda is a parameter, it's a constant. It's identified the, the behavior of this Poisson distribution. And uh, variance of x uh, is also equal to lambda. It's very interesting. Uh, this is the only distribution, the only distribution, if I remember correctly, only distribution that the expectation and the variance are the same. All right. Uh, other distribution, you, you go back to chat so far, our binomial distribution, our negative binomial distribution, even the normal distribution, the mean and the variance are not the same. Okay, in fact, uh, um, if you go back to what I just mentioned, look at this one, I divide it into many sub-interval, let's say n of them. So each one, each sub-interval is considered as a Bernoulli experiment, either zero success or one success. And the number of successes basically is can 
count how many successes over this interval, which is n trials. n can be very big. You just try to subdivide it into a very small sub-interval, so n to be big. So the idea is that if you have a binomial distribution, all right, if n is very big, then and p is smaller, then it is like a Poisson distribution. Because what I mentioned about this Poisson experiment basically is like a binomial distribution. How do I get the binomial distribution? I divide this interval into n, n Bernoulli experiments. Each sub-interval is considered as one trial. There are only two outcomes, zero success or one success. So it's a Bernoulli experiment. I have n of them. And the number of occurrence or number of success over this interval is the same as the number of occurrence over this n sub-intervals or n trials. So if n is big enough, then uh, it becomes a Poisson dis uh, distribution. All right. In fact, this, this expression is derived from the limiting distribution of the binomial distribution. But you, you, you just have to write it. Remember this one? Or you don't have to remember. But it is, depends on lambda to power x, all right? And then multiply by e to power minus lambda and then over x factorial. And it's true for all the x value or all the integers, integer value for x. Oh, is this correct? 2.17, so I remember wrong. What is e to the power 1? Huh? Is it this, this number? Huh? I hope it's correct. All right, so you can see these are the sum graphs to illustrate the Poisson distribution. This is with, with x follow a Poisson with parameter 1, which means that expectation of x equal to 1. All right. Uh, what does that mean? It means that for a given interval, you expect only one occurrence. All right. So in other words, then you ask, what's the chance that you got no occurrence? So it is relatively high. One occurrence very high. And the chance of getting, let's say, five occurrence over this interval is very small. Because we expect only one occurrence. So what's the chance that you got five occurrence, five successes there? So the probability is very small. Because you only expect one. It's very unlikely to have uh, uh, many, many successes over this interval. On the other hand, if my x follow a Poisson with four, para parameter equal to four, that means I expect four occurrence over an interval. All right? Over an interval. Then it's likely that I will have three occurrence or four occurrence. The probability is quite high. At the same time, we also expect less chance to get one occurrence. All right. And also more and more occurrence. The chance is also very small. As you can see, 10 occurrence or zero occurrence is very small. Because you expect, you expect four occurrence. So it's likely that over this interval, you will see three occurrence, four occurrence, or five occurrence. The chance you see nothing, no occurrence, is very small. The chance you see 20 occurrence is also very small. All right. So this is for Poisson 9. Poisson 9. So it's 9 occurrence in the interval. So you can see that when, when lambda is small, it's skewed to the left. All right. This is still skewed to the left. Remember, it's up to infinity. Yeah? So it's skewed to the Sorry, skew to the right, all right? My right-hand side. All right, this one look more like a symmetrical. Uh, I cannot say it's really, but, but it, you, you can see that this is the sort of like a center, and then this side is equal to this one. This, is, this one is similar to this one, the, the probability, all right? So, so this is how the graph look like for different values of lambda. And remember, lambda, lambda, the parameter lambda is equal to the expectation of x. And the variance of x is also equal to lambda. All right. So here is this. All right. Expectation of x is lambda. 
variance of lambda. So you have to you have to know all right how the parameters of the distribution for Poisson is lambda how the lambda is related to something that we understand. Expectation of X you should understand or know what it means, how to interpret expectation of X and how to interpret variance of X. So both equal to lambda. All right. For Poisson distribution. Oh, uh, so uh, so as an exercise, so we try to illustrate how to prove expectation of X. So this is the this is the PDF, sorry, probability function times the corresponding X. All right, and what are the X values? The X values from zero to infinity. All right, zero to infinity. So it's like that. But because x equal to zero, the first term is disappear because it's zero times something. So I start from x equal to one, right? At the same time, x cancel with x factorial. Is it equal to one? No, it's equal to x minus one factorial. Because x factorial is x times x minus one factorial, so I cancel with the x, so left with x minus one factorial. The rest, no change, right? So now, here is the magic. This one appear in every term. This factor, e to the power minus lambda. So I bring it out. Oh, I, I did not bring that. I, I bring lambda x. All right. So I leave it there. This one, I change to x minus 1. I change this to x minus 1 factorial. But then what happened to the lambda? I still have one lambda there. So I bring it out. So it becomes like this. All right. I just write a lambda to power x, write it into lambda times lambda to power x minus 1. All right. So what can we say about this? So what happens if I change this, call y equal to x minus 1? Then, when x equal to 1, y equal to what? y equal to 0. Where x goes to infinity, y also goes to infinity, right? Then, e to the power minus lambda is still there. Then, lambda to power x minus 1 becomes lambda to power y. x minus 1 factorial becomes y factorial. What is this? I hope it's one, huh? right? Is it one? And why? Because this is the sum of probability or sum of f of uh, f of y, y. And what is the distribution of y? This is a Poisson. And what is the parameter? Lambda. All right. This is a p a probability function of a Poisson. All right. I just call it y only. All right. You go back to the. I think it's the previous two slides, and you will see this probability function is given by this. So it just sum up all the possible probabilities. So it's equal to one. So it's a bit confusing. Huh? After I multiply by x, huh, I still come up with something that is still related to a Poisson distribution. Why? Because I take out lambda. Take out lambda. The remaining one is look like a PDF, a probability function of a random variable y, which follows a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda. All right. So the answer is lambda. Oh, this is even harder. Now we look at variance. Same trick. Ah, we don't apply it to expectation. We don't want to evaluate this one. And instead, we evaluate this one. You know why? Is it obvious? If I write it like that. 
I can cancel with this. This is x times x times x minus 2. X, so x minus 1 cancel. So it becomes x minus 2 factorial. What's the metric? Uh? How come x equals 0 just change to x equal to 2? Uh? Why? Uh? Because when x equal to 0, the term is gone. 0 times anything is 0. When x equal to 1, uh, this is 1, but this is 0. So the second term also equal to 0. When x equal to 2, that is 2 times 2 minus 1 times this thing with x equal to 2. It's not 0. So it, it's there. It's, you cannot cancel out. All right? The first two terms in this series, because of this part, okay? So the first two terms is gone. Are gone. So we just left with this one. So the same trick here. All right? So I'm going to do. So I let x equal to x mi uh, y equal to x minus 2. Then this is sum over y from when x equal to 2, this is 0, infinity, e to the power minus lambda, lambda to power um, y plus 2, right? Over y factorial. Does this add up to 1? No. This is not lambda y. This is lambda y times lambda square. So what I have to do? Bring this out. So can I just do it like that? No. It's lambda y times lambda square. So what you bring out is, is lambda square. All right? So after you bring out the lambda square, it's like this. And this sum up equal to 1. So this quantity equal to lambda square. All right? Then, what is this? Because this equal to this. So this equal to lambda square. Therefore, expectation of x square minus expectation of x equal to lambda square. All right? So, expectation of x square equal to lambda square plus lambda. Am I right? This is lambda. And finally, lambda x equal to expectation of x square minus the square of the expectation. This one equal lambda square plus lambda. This one equal to lambda square. So cancel out. So it's lambda. All right. Uh, okay. I already deprived your fun of doing all these funny cancellations. So if you don't get it, you try it again. I mean, this this is. Just a mathematical skill. This skill is useful next time when you handle something, do a sum or integration. We use this property. This is very special in probability. Is to sum up the probability function is equal to 1 or integrate the probability density function is equal to 1. So I start with considering the expectation of x times x minus 1. So I try my best to re manipulate so that Okay, apart from the lambda square, the rest is considered as the sum of a p probability function of a random variable y which follow a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda. So at the end, so we got the variance of x. All right, so variance of x is equal to lambda. All right, so um, uh, too bad, uh, I'm running out of time. So let's uh, continue with these examples next time and uh, also start the continuous distribution, a special continuous distribution. Okay, so I'll stop here today.